Hello boys and girls, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM, and in this video I'm going to talk about synchronous, asynchronous, blocking, and non-blocking computations. Now, unlike the previous videos of this channel so far, this video is targeted at general software development, so any software engineer can watch this video, although I'm going to write Scala naturally. So if you're writing Scala, I would recommend, as always, that you code alongside me, and whenever you need to refer back to these concepts, just use this video. This video is also available in written form at rockthegvm.com forward slash blog for your massive convenience. Good. Now, let me show you what I mean. So in this application, I've created a simple object to which I may attach a main method if you want to test any of the code that I'm going to write here. So. Here's the deal. Without invoking any other threads, every single thing that we write is serial, regardless of whether you're doing functional or imperative programming. However, not all things are active in the sense that they perform work. So our job is to get the most out of our CPU, but some function calls or some API calls invoke some sort of resource for, for example, like a database or a socket or an HTTP server or something like that, and wait for it to start or wait for a response. This is called a blocking call. And blocking because when you call this API, when you call the function, you can't do anything until you get a result. Let me give an example. So let me define a method that I'm going to call blocking function, which takes some sort of arguments like an X which is an int and returns an int, for example. And uh, this is a blocking call for the following reason. I'm going to do a thread sleep inside, and I'm going to sleep for 10 seconds, and I'm going to return the argument plus 42 just to simulate some sort of computation. Now, if we call this function, like blocking function, with the argument, for example, 5, and then I define a value, for example, like val meaning of life equals 42, the evaluation of this value will take 10 seconds to wait. So this will wait 10 seconds before evaluating. Okay, so this is called a blocking call because the thread that's actually running this code is idle. That is, it's not doing any work, it's not making any progress, and it's not yielding any control to the operating system or to some other thread. So this is why it's called a blocking call, because every single thing that happens after that will be waiting for it to finish. So this is a synchronous computation in the sense that the uh, calling thread has to wait. But we have the concept of an asynchronous blocking call. So if a synchronous computation performs serially like this, meaning that the subsequent expressions will need to wait before they're evaluated, then an asynchronous expression will be evaluated in parallel on another thread. So while your main program flow will carry on, your asynchronous computation also runs this at the same time. So this happens, of course, due to both multiprocessor systems, uh, which will allow us to perform multiple computations at literally at the same time because we have multi-core computers at the time of this recording, and also because of the smart process scheduling, which is a mechanism by which the operating system schedules multiple things uh, at seemingly the same time, but the uh, switch becomes so fast that we can barely tell the difference. Let me give an example. So um, in Scala, we can write an asynchronous function. Let's call this async blocking function, which takes an argument like x int and returns a future. So in Scala, we have the concept of a future, which we can import via Scala concurrent future. And this is the type of computation that will evaluate on another thread at some point in the future. This is why it's called a future. And I'm going to use the future constructor, and I'm going to do the same thread sleep with 10 seconds, and I'm going to return the argument plus 42. Now, in order to actually run the future, you will need some sort of a thread pool in which in Scala it's called an execution context, and I'm going to import the default one. So I'm going to import Scala concurrent execution context implicits global. So this is the global execution context, which has a thread pool on which we can evaluate this future. So um, this particular computation is asynchronous in the sense that if I call that async blocking function with the argument five, and then I do val another meaning of life equals, I don't know, 43 or something like that, this evaluates immediately. 
because the async blocking function returns immediately. So it yields control to the calling thread. So the calling thread can continue, can carry on the uh, normal flow of the program, but the function call will be delegated to another thread. So this actual expression will be evaluated on some other thread. However, it's still blocking because that other poor thread will need to be idle for 10 seconds. So that thread will still be blocked because it will not make any progress, it will be idle, it will not do any work, and it will not yield control over the flow of this particular code. Now the blocking aspect of this still blocking computation is that this kind of code needs to be constantly monitored for completion. It's like you spawned an annoying parrot which is constantly bugging you with, are you done? Are you done? Are you completed? Are you done? How about now? And so on and so forth, so that when this code is indeed completed, the parrot will store the appropriate value in this future so that you can monitor it from the calling thread. So if the first function was synchronous and blocking, the second function that I wrote here is asynchronous in the sense that its value is evaluated on another thread, but it's still blocking because it introduces the same problem on some other poor guy. So. Um, Here's what I'm going to address with asynchronous and non-blocking. Now the true non-blocking power comes from actions that do not block either you, that is the calling thread, or someone else, some secondary thread as was the case here in the se second function. So um, the best example that I can give is with an Akka actor. So an actor, unlike what you may have read from the webs, is not something active, it's just a data structure. And the power of Akka comes from the fact that you can create a huge amount of actors, like millions per gig up heap, so that a small number of threads can operate on these actors in a smart way via scheduling. So let me define a method. So I'm going to define a method called create simple actor, which uh, will use the Akka typed API, which is pretty convoluted, and uh, I'm going to make it as uh, simple as possible. I'm going to use behaviors from Akka actor typed uh, uh, Scala DSL, behaviors.receive message, and I'm going to type this receive message with a string, meaning that this actor that will have this behavior will only be able to receive string messages. And uh, here we'll, we will need to pass in a lambda from a string to another behavior. So I'm going to define some message. And uh, as a reaction to some message which I know is a string, I will print something out, like I received a message, and I'm going to inject this. So some message, and I need to return another behavior that this actor will change as a result of receiving this message. And I will use behaviors.same. Cool. So behaviors.same will keep the same uh, lambda here as a receive handler for messages that this actor will receive. Now the Alka typed API is a little bit obscure, and I'm going to talk about that another time. And by the way, if you want to access the Alka uh, library types here, you can go to your build SBT and add this particular line over here, com type safe aka and aka actor typed. I'm also going to add it to the video description so that you can copy that to your project as well. Good. Now, let's create an actor which will have this behavior and I'm going to define that as the root of an actor system. So I'm going to define a root actor as an actor system and I'm going to use actor system from aka actor typed, and uh, I'm going to pass create simple actor. That will be the behavior of the topmost actor of this actor system. And I'm going to name this test system or something like that. And uh, this root actor is an actor reference so that we can actually send messages to it. So uh, the root actor can support the tell method, which is uh, this bang operator over here, and I'm going to send a string to it. So I'm going to say, let's call this message in a bottle. Now, when you send a message to an actor, uh, this message is enqueued in this actor's mailbox, so that at some point in the future, a thread which is backing this actor system will 
actually schedule this actor for execution, and uh, a thread will take control of this actor and will start dequeuing messages from its mailbox, and it will run this lambda in sequence for every single message in this actor's mailbox. So, at some point in the future, a thread will schedule this actor that I've created for execution, and it will run this lambda, this behavior, for this particular message that I've enqueued at this moment. So, the calling thread, which is running the bang operator over here, is just and queuing a message. And this particular action is asynchronous and non-blocking. Why asynchronous? Because it's uh, on a separate thread and not blocking because the calling thread, this particular thread, can carry on the natural flow of the program. And uh, it's non blocking because now no other thread is being blocked either. In fact, no other thread is being spawned at all by this bang operator over here. The uh, threads that are backing this actor system will take care of themselves and they will be scheduled by the actor system's dispatcher so that they can actually run these actors. Okay, so this is completely asynchronous and non-blocking. So this is very powerful. Asynchronous non-blocking computation is actually what you want. However, even in this very simple example, we have a drawback because we aren't returning any meaningful value out of this interaction. The bang operator just returns a unit. So uh, to solve that, we can return a future which the actor might complete manually. And uh, for that, I have another video with controllable futures in Scala if you want to check it out. I'm going to attach that to the video description as well. So here's what I'm going to write. I'm going to write a small API that will interact with an actor and will return a future which you can then monitor for completion. So uh, here's what I'm going to write. I'm going to define another actor system, another root actor in another system. I'm going to call this promise resolver as an actor system and I'm going to pass uh, its behavior which in the very similar fashion I'm going to run a behaviors.receive message and uh, I'm going to make this actor receive instead of a string I'm going to make it receive a tuple of type string and promise of whatever kind of computation you want to return at the end of the interaction for example a promise int so um, I'm going to import Scala concurrent promise and um, given that this lambda takes a tuple between string and promise int, I can actually decompose that with a partial function right off the bat. So in case I receive some message as a string and a promise as a promise int, I can do some computations. For example, I can do promise.success and I can um, fulfill this promise with the message's length. So message.length. And then I'm going to return the next behavior that this actor will have, which is behaviors.same. Cool. Now this was the behavior of the actor. Let me also give this a name. Let's call this promise resolver. Now, this particular actor, when it receives a tuple of string and promise int, this promise int will be fulfilled by the actor at some point when some thread of the actor system actually schedules it for execution. And I'm going to define a small API method, like do async non-blocking computation, and I'm going to make it receive an argument like s colon string, and it will return a future int. And um, I'm going to return a future int by creating a promise. So I'm going to create a promise. This pattern is exemplified in the controllable futures video that I recorded roughly two weeks ago. And I'm going to define a promise int. And then I'm going to pass it away uh, as well as the string argument to this promise resolver. So I'm going to say promise resolver tell, and I'm going to use the tuple the argument s and a promise. And then I'm going to return a promise that future. Why do I do that? Well, if I do this and I return the future int, this future will be fulfilled when this promise is fulfilled. And this promise is fulfilled when this actor is being scheduled to run. And uh, in this way, I'm returning a future without actually blocking any thread. So. Um, I can actually invoke this API, let's call this 
async non blocking result as do async non blocking computation with some message. And this will be a future int, which will be computed on a different thread. So this is async and also non blocking because I'm not waiting for another thread or for anything else to happen when this actor is actually being scheduled for uh, running. So uh, I can actually do async non blocking result dot oncomplete and I can, for example, print it out to the console. So with this pattern over here, in this way, neither the calling thread nor some other thread is immediately used by the call, so it neither is blocked, and we still return meaningful values, meaning a future of something, which we can register a callback on to monitor for completion. Now, for some reason, the ask pattern in Aka typed, which this particular pattern simulates, is very, very convoluted, but I'm going to talk about the Aka typed API another time. All right, so I hope this was useful. You can find the links to everything that we discussed in the description attached to this video. Now, if you like it, go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe because more videos like this will be coming soon. In the meantime, follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn for updates on upcoming material. And in the meantime, thanks for watching.